That same old serpent is a phrase that I am sure you have heard a couple of times as a believer. The devil's strategies are still the same old ones, but they keep coming up in new ways. There is nothing new under the sun, and in the same way, there are no new tricks that the devil uses on God's creation, apart from the one we all know about, lies. The lies that he whispers into our ears, or drops into our minds, or uses the voices of people to talk to us are the weapons that he has against the children of God. Once you understand that the devil has no real power other than the one that you give him, you will live the overcoming life. When you look at the Word of God, there is a perfect description of who the devil is, and that is who he is up to date. Here's what the scriptures say in John 8:44. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus was addressing the Jews and referring to their inability to abide in the truth. Because of this, he called them the children of the devil because the truth was not in them. Jesus goes on to call the devil a liar and a father of lies. Anytime the devil speaks, as Jesus has told us, he speaks a lie. There is not a single day that the devil will ever utter the truth. Lies have been his strategy from the beginning. When God had made man and woman in his image and likeness, he gave them charge over everything that was in the Garden of Eden. He permitted them to eat from every tree in Eden, but forbade them from eating from the tree at the center of it. The devil inhabiting the serpent started a conversation with Eve, Adam's wife. This conversation led to the seduction of Eve because of the lies of the devil. So Eve took and ate the fruits from the tree in the middle of the garden. Whatever the devil told the woman sounded very sweet in her ears. Satan sold the idea of being like gods to Eve, an idea that cost him his place in heaven as an anointed cherub. God expressly declared that the man he was going to create was going to be in his image and likeness. There was no reason for Eve to be deceived by the devil. So when Adam ate of the fruit like his wife, that was when man fell. Later on, in the cool of the day, God came to visit his people, only for them to hide because they were naked. When God was following up on the matter, here's what Eve said, Genesis 3.13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The devil successfully sold a bunch of lies to the woman, and this led to spiritual death. From the first Adam, every human being is brought forth in a fallen state. The lies that seduced Eve and ultimately Adam caused them to behave contrary to what God desired from them. Disobedience came from those lies. Adam and Eve did not know what disobedience was until they met the one acquainted with disobedience, the devil. In the same way, the devil still uses the same strategy on us today. He presents us with lies and we buy them. It is sad to know that believers also buy into those lies and they suffer the consequences. The lies of the devil are so subtle, and more often than not, they are convincing to the point that they will not even seem like they are wrong. Satan has mastered the way human beings behave, and he knows what to do to take their focus from God and turn it to himself. Have you ever found yourself more than willing to do the wrong thing simply because you have a justifiable cause? 
Maybe you insulted someone back or became rude and mean to someone because they were the first ones to be mean and rude to you. Or have you ever found yourself more willing to be selfish because everyone around you seems to be selfish and self-centered? Have you found yourself in a place where you are unwilling to forgive and let things go because you are justified to harbor your anger and unforgiveness? Do you see how all these things feel acceptable in a society that has embraced them wholeheartedly? We are slowly forgetting how God expects us to act because the devil lies to us that it is okay to behave the way we behave. This happens to so many people. When you give room to the lies of the devil, they will become your reality soon enough. If every time you do not have money in your pockets, you start telling everyone how broke and how poor you are, soon enough, you will be broken poor. Know for sure that the devil has something to say for every situation in your life. He wants to take advantage of every moment and whisper something into your ears. The question is whether or not you will endorse what the devil tells you or what God tells you. There is only one strategy to use to conquer the devil and his plans. That is to know the truth and live by the truth. In the book of John chapter 17, while Jesus was praying, he said something profound. He asked the Father to sanctify us with the truth because the Word of God is truth. This statement of life shows us that there is only one truth that we need to live by as long as we are alive. The Word of God is the only truth you need to get acquainted with and to live by at all times. Remember, a lie can only be conquered by the truth. So when the devil tries to bring any lies to you and to seduce you into wrong thinking, acting, and living, pull out the word of God that will counter him and he will flee from you. If any thought or idea comes to your mind that raises doubts in you concerning what God has said, know it is from the devil. If you are trusting God for something, and every time you think about that thing, a question pops up in your mind that starts with, but why? No, it is the devil. Never allow him to lie to you that you are sick. No way, you are healed by God. Never permit him to lie to you that you are poor and rejected. No way, you are rich and accepted in the beloved. Never let him lie to you that you are stupid and cannot do anything right. No way! You have the mind of Christ and an excellent spirit dwells in you. He can lead you and guide you into doing everything right and get everything right. Never allow the devil to lie to you that you are not important and no one cares about you in the whole world. Remind yourself that God cared enough to send his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to come and die for you so that he can reconcile you to him. It is better to have God care for you even if no one else does. When God cares for you, no one can ignore you. You must build yourself so that you can effectively resist the devil and his seductive lies. You must grow in the knowledge of God and His Word. That is the only key. I know you are thinking about prayer, and you are right, but you can only be effective in prayer when you understand the Word of God, because power is in the Word of God. You cannot expect to conquer the devil when you make vain repetitions in prayer. Your prayer must be full of the Word. It is only the Word that sanctifies you from all the whispers of the devil. It is the Word that will build your faith to stand against the devil and to subdue him, his tactics and his oppressions. Here's what the Bible says in Romans 10:17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the Word about Christ. When the Word of God is in you and it has built your faith, when you hear a lie, you will respond by affirmations of faith. You will not meditate over the lie, but the truth 
of the Word of God. You will wage war with the Word of faith until you win the war that the devil wages against you. When you look at the Bible in the book of Revelations 12, 11, you will see something so beautiful. It says, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. The Bible records that we have overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb. We have also overcome him by the word of our testimony. What will be your testimony today? Are you going to speak what the devil says or what God says? Your testimony will cause you to overcome the devil or it will turn you into his victim. The choice is yours to make. But as God said, he has put before you life and death, but he prefers that you choose life. I would also prefer that you choose life. Life is in the word of God. Choose the word of God even when it does not seem like it is working out. Be confident that it will never fail because the word of God never fails regardless of the situation. Life can really put us in situations that get us questioning the capabilities of God. Where we move from God can to can God really? At this hour, will God really show up? In this situation, will God really provide a solution? As helpless as I am, is there any hope for me? We question and question and question. But you should know this today. God is limitless. He is infinite. He has no minimum or maximum as to what he can do. There is no limitation as to where he can be and at what time he can show up in our situations. God can do anything, but you first need to believe that he can and stop limiting him. You desire to do something great with your life, but you think it's impossible. God showed you in a vision that you would be a great evangelist, but you are full of doubt. You want to live an impactful life, but you don't see yourself as capable. You desire to make a change in the society, but something is holding you back. You want to start a Bible school, but you have a whole bunch of reasons why you think it's not going to happen. That is limiting God. When we doubt whether God can use us to continue his work on earth, we limit him. We show how we see him as incapable of doing great things through us. We display unbelief in his power. God dislikes it when we limit him on what he should do with our lives. It's like telling him, you know what, God? You said I should be an international preacher, but I'm content with ministering at the local church. It's telling God, I don't think I can do this. So-and-so would be in a better position to. This is complicated for me. I can't do it. But God has no limits as to who he chooses to do his work. He chose Moses, even though he stuttered. He chose Jeremiah, even though he was young and he did not know how to speak. He chose Gideon, even though he was the least of his family and his family belonged to the least of the clans of Israel. Yet, through all of them, God did great wonders. He did not see them as limited men, but as people who, by his unlimited power, could do marvelous work. When Gideon was getting ready for the battle against the Midianites, he chose 32,000 men, ready to fight a Midianite army four times their size. They were already outnumbered. Yet God said that there were too many of them to give them victory over their enemies. He asked Gideon to reduce the number, not once, but twice. At the end, Gideon was left with only 300 men. Now that must have been really hard on Gideon, first being outnumbered, then as if that's not enough, having his men reduced. Yet he did not doubt that God would give him the victory. He did not limit God to the size of the army or the number of men. He understood that there was no limit as to what God could do. 
and God gave them the victory over a way larger army. When you look at your surroundings, you will lose your faith in God. You will only see the big army against army, and not the greatest God you serve who is on your side. Stop looking at how small your army is, or how large the enemy's army is, and focus on God. Look up to him, because there is nothing that he cannot do. If he says, you only need one man, then trust him. Do not doubt his power. Do not begin complaining, telling him how there are tens of men against you. As long as we keep our focus on the capabilities of God, we will maintain our faith. When Peter saw Jesus walking on water, he said to him, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. And when Jesus asked him to walk on water, Peter did. As long as he looked on the unlimited Jesus, he kept himself above the water. But the moment he looked around him and saw the winds, he began to doubt that he could continue walking on the water. And at that moment, he began to sink. When he cried out to Jesus to save him, Jesus asked him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? This is what happens when we doubt. When we focus too much on our limitations, we lose it. We lose our faith. If God tells us to walk on water, and due to doubts we say, God, I am human, I cannot walk on water, then we definitely won't. Stop focusing on your situation. Look up to him who can do all things. He even said that whatever we ask of him in faith, we will receive. We know Abraham as the father of the faith. It was not easy to wait for a promised son for 25 years, especially at the advanced age he and his wife were in. Yet he did not limit God. He did not doubt that God would really fulfill his promise. He held on what to God had said. 25 years was long time enough to get discouraged, to give up the way, to tell God, God, you promised, but with so much time gone, I don't think you're going to do it. But not even once did Abraham let doubt creep into his heart. He held on to the promise for two and a half decades. He knew that God was not limited to time. He wasn't limited to seasons. And eventually the promise came into fulfillment through Isaac. I know there was a time that you really believed God would perform a miracle for you. You had absolute faith that things were going to change. You had no doubts because God would do what he said. But somewhere along the way you lost your stand. Your faith began to falter. The light you were seeing began to dim and your hope kept going down. Reclaim your faith. Ask God, who is beyond limitation, to restore your faith. It is not the end of things. Even Peter experienced the same thing. But when he called unto Jesus, he was saved. Jesus was a great friend to Lazarus. When Lazarus died, his sisters Mary and Martha were deeply broken. Many people came to mourn with them. When at last, Jesus went to Bethany, where the sisters lived with their brother. Martha came to him and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Notice how much faith Martha shows. Yes, Jesus might be late. Yes, Lazarus might be dead for four days. He might be smelling, but even now a miracle can happen. Even now, Lazarus can live again. When Martha had sent out to Jesus during Lazarus' sickness, they were requesting him to come as a healer. All they wanted was for their brother to get well. But Martha does not limit Jesus to healing only. She is telling Jesus, I know you as a healer, but that is not the only thing you can do. Your power is not limited to healing. You might be in a situation where God did some miracle for you yesterday, but today you are doubting him. The last time you were sick, you received healing through prayers, but this time around, you think that they're not being answered. Stop limiting God. What he did yesterday, he can do today and the day after. 
In fact, God can do exceedingly more than we ask him if we do so by faith. He delivered the Israelites from bondage in Egypt. He gave them a way through the Red Sea. He gave them warmth and light at night and shade by the day during the Exodus. Yet when the journey became harder than they anticipated, they began to doubt. Their unbelief was stirred within them. The Bible says in Psalms 78:19 that the people began to speak against God, saying, Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck a rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? The scripture continues to say that the Lord heard this and got furious at Israel. And a fire was kindled against them, for they did not believe him. The Israelites had seen the great works of the Lord, and yet they still doubted. They had witnessed the plagues and the historical deliverance from Egypt, the miraculous passing through the Red Sea, and yet they doubted what God could do. God got angry at them. It is so easy to fall into the temptation of limiting God. When our finances are going down, it's easy to limit God. When we are sick, it's easy to doubt the truth in, by his strokes we are healed. When things are not going well for us, the scripture that says all things happen for the good of those who believe in God might not make sense to us. To grow into a level where we still believe in the power of God, despite everything, we must boost our faith daily. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing, and by hearing the word of God. Read the word more. By reading the Bible, you will explore many incidents where the unlimited power of God was shown, despite the human limitation that might have been there. Pray to God to replenish your faith. Ask him to clear your doubts and unbelief and to forgive you for doubting. Remind yourself daily that God is not limited. He is not limited that he cannot change your situation. He is not limited that he can fail to heal you. He is not limited that a breakthrough in your life would be too much for him to do. Do not wait to see that you may believe but believe that you will see the fulfillment of what God has promised. Do not limit what God can do in your life. Allow him to use you. Allow him to do exceedingly more than you could ever think of. God has not given up on you. One of the ways the devil will use to make you drift further away from God is lie to you that God has given up on you. The devil will constantly whisper to you that the Lord is no longer with you. He'll tell you that God has stopped loving you. Now this is a lie. God never gives up on us. He never will. Even though we might sin against him so many times, his love and mercy will always be great enough to take us back into his fold. It doesn't matter how big you have sinned or how far from his love you might have wandered, but God will never give up on you. Us humans are prone to getting tired and getting bored and giving up on people. Someone might come asking for help for you the first time, and you help them with a glad heart and a smiling face. But when they do it the second and third times, you might get irritated. You begin to feel like they're taking advantage of you. You lose joy from helping others or just stop altogether. But God's not like us men. That is not his character. He has no maximum number of times that we can go to him and ask for his mercy once more. There is no limit to the number of times the Lord will come to our rescue. When he created Adam and Eve, he placed them in the Garden of Eden. He provided them with fruit of all nature that they would not hunger. He gave them a simple instruction not to eat the fruit of the tree at the middle of the garden. But Adam and Eve, out of disobedience and ignorance, ate of the fruit. When their eyes were opened and they realized that they had sinned, they hid away from the Lord. They had no courage to face Him. Even though their disobedience hurt God, He still went out looking for them. It didn't stop Him from helping them out. He did not give up on them. He did not let them suffer shame from their nakedness, but instead He sewed garments for them. Even though He kicked them out of the garden, He didn't leave them with no means of survival. He told them to toil the ground and get their livelihood from there. Now, Psalm 86, 15 says, But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion 
and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. God is merciful. He never gives up on His children. When people have given up on you, He hasn't. When you've given up on yourself, God has not. His mercies are new every single morning. Our Lord is slow to anger and quick to forgive. Don't shy from going back to Him and repenting if you've sinned. His arms are wide open to embrace you back. God sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. He did not let mankind fall from their disobedience in the garden forever. You see, He sent a Savior so that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. His grace is sufficient for us. Jesus taught on the attitude of God in the parable of the prodigal son. You see, in that teaching, once the son realized his mistake and came back to his father with a remorseful heart, the father took him back happily. Notice what he says in Luke chapter 15, verses 22 through 24. Quick, bring the best robe and put on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Jesus taught also about the lost sheep. A shepherd with a hundred sheep leaves the ninety-nine that never left his side and goes out to look for the one that strayed. You see, when he finds it, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that didn't wander off. Same as the woman with the one hundred coins that loses one. She lights a lamp, sweeps her house in search of the coin, and when she finds it, she rejoices together with her neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. Now, these parables demonstrate the love that God has for us, the unconditional, unfathomable love. Even when we stray, God goes out to look for us. He celebrates when the sinner is converted. The Bible says that there is rejoicing of the angels in heaven when one sinner repents. God rejoices when one wayward man repents and gives his life to Christ. It makes God happy. It delights him. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, God doesn't give up on you even when you've sinned against him. 1 John 2 verse 1 says, My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If God let his Son die for us while we were still sinners, how much more is he ready to forgive when we come to him with resentful hearts and ask for his forgiveness? God's love is the same for all of us. He loves the vilest man and will be glad if he turns to him. Even though he does not approve of our sinful ways, this will not stop him from forgiving us when we go back to him. We might sin, but God will never give up on us. He says that even though our sins might be as red as ribbon, He will cleanse us and make them white as snow. If we confess our sins, He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, God doesn't give up on us even when we depart from the will He has for our lives. You see, God sent Jonah to preach to the city of Nineveh, but Jonah, due to his disobedience, chose to go to Tarshish, away from God's will. The sea became very rough. They couldn't sail safely to the shore. So Jonah, who had confessed to them that he was running away from God, told them to throw him into the sea. So they did. Despite his disobedience, God never gave up on Jonah. He didn't let him perish in the raging sea water. He didn't let him be consumed by the animals of the sea. But instead, God provided a big fish that swallowed Jonah. For three days and nights, Jonah stayed in the belly of the fish. And when he realized his mistake and cried out to God one more time, God ordered the fish to vomit Jonah safely on dry land. Now, even though you might have disobeyed the instruction of God, he hasn't given up on you. Even though you might have done contrary to what he told you, he still has room for you. God has not given up on you. Trust in him. Trust that he still has your interests at heart. Trust that he knows everything and that he chooses what is best for you. Trust in God that His plans for your life are the best, and despite everything that happens in your life, it's for your very own good. God does not give up on us even when we doubt Him. He still loves us even when our faith in Him is weak. He delivered the Israelites from bondage in Egypt, but when the journey to the Promised Land became hard, they began to doubt His power. They murmured and complained within themselves. They got very discouraged. The Bible says that the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. 
Numbers 21, verse 4. God's anger kindled at them due to their lack of faith, and he sent very venomous serpents. Yet in his abounding love and mercy, he provided them with a means of healing from the snake's venom. He instructed Moses to make a bronze serpent and lift it up so that whoever looked at it by faith got healed. Now, sometimes we forget what God did for us in the past. We forget the blessings he gave us. We forget the great deeds he did for us. Even then, he doesn't give up on us. Like he did for the Israelites, he will forgive us. And even though they rebelled by the sea, forgetting his mercies, he still saved them. He doesn't give up on us when we fall into temptation. By his grace, he lifts us up from sin and washes us clean. He loves us unconditionally. Despite our many flaws, God will never give up on us. We may disobey him like Adam and Eve, but he will never give up on us. We might doubt his power like the Israelites, but he still loves us. We might forget how much he blessed us in the past and begin to complain about our current situation, but he loves us still. We might leave the comfort of his embrace and wander into faraway lands like the prodigal son, but when we come back, his hands will be wide open to embrace us back. We might flee from his will for our lives like Jonah, but he will use his own means to rescue us. He'll provide us with a fish to keep us safe from the stormy sea and the dangerous sea animals. God will never fail us, no matter how many times we fail him ourselves. Lamentations chapter 3 verses 22 and 23 says, Because of the Lord's great love we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Our God is kind and merciful. He is abounding in love. He is gracious and compassionate. He is slow to anger. His anger lasts only a moment, but his favor a lifetime. He pours out his love on us such that his mercies are new every morning. He gives us a fresh chance every day to turn back and go to him, to repent of our sins and live by his grace. He is a God of unending love and second chances. Each new day is a chance to change the directions of our lives and start walking towards the destiny he's planned for us. God never gives up on us. Trust in him. Believe him when he assures you of forgiveness once you repent. Trust in the will he has for you. He knows what is best for you and does what is best for you. He has not given up on you, but you've got to trust in his plan. If he says to go to Nineveh, don't change course and sail to Tarshish. Do what the Lord says. You might have messed up. You might be feeling low and discouraged, but that is not the end of it. You see, God is calling unto you. He is telling you today, come back to me, child. His loving grace is amazing. We cannot comprehend it. We can let ourselves enjoy his free gift of mercies by running into his embrace once more. God is not done with you. It is not over until God says it is over. Anytime you want to do any significant thing in your life, you always begin by preparing yourself, whether mentally emotionally, physically, or spiritually. Preparation is part and parcel of the eminent life we are all pursuing. If you fail to prepare, you are already one step closer to total failure. In the place of preparation, you tirelessly work to ensure that you are ready for whatever your endeavors are concerning where you want to be in life. You cannot wake up one morning and decide this is the day I will do one, two, three. When that idea strikes your mind, you immediately start preparing by searching for everything you will need to ensure you are successful. A perfect example is when you want to start a business. Before you start, you must prepare yourself for it because if you do not, you will make all kinds of blunders and your dreams will never take off. You start by doing researches about the business. You need to find a strategic location, find out how much you will need to start and keep it going until it has taken roots and you will need to find ways to make it competitive. Other than that, you need to find out about the licenses you need and decide the best way to run the business. You cannot jump into it without any concrete knowledge of what you are doing. You will be unfair to yourself and your dreams. In the same way, there is a place that God is taking you and there are things that God wants to trust you with. When he says he has good plans for you, he also means big thoughts that you cannot fathom with your mind. 
it will be unfair for him to trust you with those things and those responsibilities without equipping you properly because things will flop. You know, the greater you become, the more responsibility you will have to handle. Imagine if you become a mighty person, yet you cannot bear the many responsibilities that come with your status. You will end up frustrated and ineffective. When God trusts you with that much, there will be a lot of expectations, and that is exactly what the Bible lets us know. Here is what we see in the book of Luke 12:48. The Bible says, but the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. It does not get more uncomplicated than that. When much is given to you, you ought to give more when people ask of you. Now, for you to handle everything that God has in store for you, there will be a time of preparation. This time of preparation will require a lot of waiting without murmurings. The wait may seem endless and tiring, but you can trust God it will come to a glorious end and it will be worth the wait. God does not waste our time. He has a record of bringing things to a marvelous and expected end. The Bible records that God can perform and perfect that which he begins in us. Your case cannot be any different. When Jesus walked upon the face of the earth, he gathered unto himself the 12 disciples, and these were the closest to him before their numbers grew. One of the names that the disciples used to call Jesus was a teacher. This fact is so significant because Jesus was their teacher, and he was training them on how to carry out the works of the kingdom of light. He knew very well that after his purpose on earth was accomplished and he went back to be with the Father in heaven, he would need men that would continue doing what he was doing and on higher levels. That's why he says this in John 14, 12. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. There were more significant works to be done even after his ascension, and these works needed people who could do them. So when he was with them, he taught them and trained them. He was preparing them for the future without him being physically present with them. It is delightful to know that he even put them on the test when he sent out the 70 for missions without him. Jesus ensured that the disciples were more equipped for everything he wanted to put in their hands by asking them to wait for the Holy Spirit. He gave them exactly what made him who he was on the face of the earth, the Spirit of God. That is because he was the one in him doing all the awe-inspiring works. Jesus instructed them to tarry in the upper room until they received power from above. They followed the instruction, and after receiving the promise, the Bible records that many miracles were done by the hands of the apostles. It is because of the disciples and their striving together for the gospel that the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ got to us. They were well prepared and equipped. The master could not commission them without preparing them in that place of waiting. I know that you can sense a greater purpose for your life and for what you are going through. I know that you have a conviction in your heart that the future is more than bright, but you may not understand the waiting process for the manifestation. I want you to be at ease and be fully persuaded that God will never waste your time. Everything you will see in the end will be worth the wait. Keep waiting on the Lord and he will renew your strength. Anything and everything the Lord does has a purpose. It is never in vain. The book of Lamentations 325 states something so inspiring. It says, the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. The Holy Spirit is always very particular with his choice of words. And for him to have chosen the word good in the verse above, he was intentional about it. He wanted you to know that you cannot wait on the Lord and get a mediocre result at the end of it all. Now, he goes on to add that God is good to the soul that seeks him. That means that even as you wait, you have to have a heart that seeks after him. You cannot fold your hands and sit back waiting on God to do his part and you fail to do yours. Go through your waiting period understanding that God is preparing you for something greater than everybody will look at and acknowledge that it can only be by God. 
before he can trust you with much, he must build your capacity to accommodate what he is preparing for you in this life. He has to equip you lest your strength fails when the adversary rises to wage war against you. I am sure you know that the greater you are, the more violent the adversary will come for you. So other than handling the responsibilities that follow greatness, you must have the full capacity to defend what God gives you at any time and when anyone or anything tries to take it away from you. If not, you will lose those things in a landslide. When you can defend and fight for them after God delivers them to you, they will remain with you for generations to come. Look at the story of David. God chose him after rejecting King Saul, but that did not mean that he became king immediately. No, he went through a waiting process that was both frustrating and grueling. King Saul was always on his heels trying to kill him. He faced wars and so many things in his journey towards kingship. One thing David knew how to do was to wait patiently on the Lord. He was never in a hurry to move by his power and might. Throughout his Psalms, he makes it crystal clear of his trust and hope in God. He goes further to confidently tell us that those who wait on the Lord and put their trust in him cannot be put to shame. This truth convicts your heart that God will not bring forth something that will shame you at the end of the wait. I know you may not even see what God is preparing you for, but if you have to contend for what you believe, the good waiting for you, Romans 8.25 says something so beautiful. It says, but if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Everything we hope for, we wait for it patiently. Do not be in a rush for a premature manifestation. Allow the fullness of time to come and you will behold with your physical eyes what God was doing all along. As you wait, rejoice and offer up prayers of thanksgiving. Keep affirming how God is wonderful and all the marvelous things he has done for you. Keep your spirit charged up while waiting regardless of the surrounding situations, whether pleasant or unpleasant. You are destined for so much in this life. God says that he has made us the heads and not the tails. He is the one that raises men from the dung and sets them among the princes of this world. When you finally see what he has been preparing you for, you will live to testify about it. It will excite you, inspire you, motivate you, strengthen your faith and bless your soul. You will see the hand of God upon your life in a way that provokes you unto more glorious exploits to the glory of your Father in heaven. Trust God with everything you have till the end of the wait. You cannot afford to hold back or backtrack. You will be cheating yourself out of the substantial blessings in life, and it is riskier than holding on to the end. If you want to mount up with wings as an eagle, run and not be weary, or walk and not faint, wait. There is nothing to lose but everything to gain. It does not get any better than this. In no time, everything will come together beautifully, and it will unfold magnificently before your family, friends, colleagues, relatives, enemies, frenemies, and the world at large. It will be a public affair. Trust me on that. Have you ever heard of the saying, heavy is the head that wears the crown? Well, it is as accurate as Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Every human has dreams of being the greatest and the best version of themselves, and it is a valid desire that can benefit the world. However, a small percentage of these people are willing to work to be who they desire to be. The path to greatness is not made of candy and honey. No, it is not a path lined up with flowers of all kinds to keep you motivated and inspired to take the next step. No, it is a path that is full of reasons to make you quit the journey. If you lack strength, stamina, inner motivation, inner conviction, and the grace for the trip, you will only take three steps forward and 10 steps backward. The path to all that you are meant to be is not easy. It is a road less traveled by most. There are challenges, temptations, mocking, persecutions, and more. It takes real guts to travel it. The beauty of this 
is that as much as you will go through the valley of the shadow of death, when you get to the end, you will thank God you did. What will be waiting for you will be much more than what you hoped for in the beginning. You see, you will always go through more because you are destined for more. Everyone that is mightily used by God has a story to share. They have stories that unveil their scars, their wounds, and their pains. It is never a smooth ride. But these are the people that have done so many wonders all over the world, and they are still shaking the world. This fact does not only apply to believers, but also to non-believers. Life does not wait for someone to hand them valuable things on a silver platter. People will always tell you of the sweat, tears, and blood they put in to be who they are in society, nation, or the world. In God's kingdom, God has provided you with extraordinary things. We have it all because of Jesus Christ and not by our deeds. Jesus Christ earned us everything that he has. We are righteous, holy, blessed, accepted, forgiven, rich, powerful, full of authority, full of the divine life, full of wisdom, are favored, glorified, justified, and so much more. In Christ, we have access to all of these, and we do not have to do anything apart from believing in the works and sacrifices of Christ. Here is how we are sure of this truth. 1 Corinthians 3.21 says, Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Yes, all things are yours to enjoy freely, but you have to be wise enough to know that there is a part that you have to play to enjoy all of these things. Apart from that, we also have an enemy, the devil, the passion that he has is destruction. God gives us everything, and the devil wants to take everything from us. I am sure you are not ignorant of his devices and what his mission is, and that is to steal, kill, and destroy. Apart from the devil, we also have another enemy, our flesh. The scriptures tell us that the flesh wages war against the spirit, that is why the spirit is always willing, but the flesh is weak. The flesh and the devil are the most notorious enemies of destinies. They will not let you get there as smoothly as possible. That is the reason why you will go through so much before you reach your divine destination. You will face some cruel and frustrating situations that will make you wish you were someone else. There will be times when you will encounter destiny helpers who will walk with you a few miles into the journey, and God bless them. There are other times when you will walk alone because you have to do it all by yourself. The secret to conquering the flesh is to submit yourself wholly to the guiding of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us in Galatians 5.16, this I say then, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You must rise and decide to walk in the Spirit at all times. When you do that, you will tame the flesh. You will do what you have to do in the right way, at the right time, and at the right place, whether the body feels like it or not. You will no longer heed to the flesh and its emotions and feelings because it doesn't always feel like doing the things that will build you but the things that will gratify it. Most times, the flesh wants all the wrong things that will derail you and make your journey more difficult because of costly mistakes that have more expensive consequences. These mistakes can cause rejection, persecution, hatred from people. On the other hand, to conquer the devil and his schemes to bring you down and destroy your calling, you must have the Word of God dwell richly in you. You must have a rich fellowship with your Creator and be aware and conscious of the power you have in Christ and how to exercise it. When you know all these, you will be able to put the devil in his place and smell his works from a distance. From there, you can be able to undo his plans 
frustrate his efforts, and ultimately destroy his works. You know, the devil comes with all kinds of weapons for anyone destined for greatness. So you can be sure that when the devil sees you are up for greatness, he will come with everything he has to ensure you do not fulfill your call. That means that you must also have the spiritual stamina and grit to handle him. You cannot joke with your spiritual life and expect the devil will lose interest in attacking you. He will not. He will stir up all kinds of trouble and storms for you. He will use circumstances, your slip-ups, your environment, your family, friends and enemies, and even your career. You must be spiritually awake and alert to see his manipulations over things. If not, you will start to hate people, yourself, your environment, and your career. When hate comes into your heart, how far do you think you will go? Nothing of darkness should ever come into your heart for any reason because it will kill your destiny. Here is what the word of the Lord says in Proverbs 4.23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Now I know that it is easy to comprehend the flesh and the devil as sources of hardship as you journey towards your call. There is also another angle that you must look at things. Whoever God calls to greatness, he will subject them to a period of training and testing. God hands out the keys to eminence, but he also develops and proves your character. If he gives you the keys without proper training and testing, the keys may be your end. That is why the Bible records that it is possible to begin in the spirit and finish in the flesh. I have seen this in so many lives. A person will seek after God with all their heart when they are pursuing something. The moment they get what they want, they revert to their old selves. They do not acknowledge nor depend on God anymore. This is how their downfall begins. Seasons of training and testing with God are not easy as one would expect them to be. They will be tough and they will stretch your faith to levels you did not think are possible. These training and tests will test your level of obedience and sacrifice. There are times when God will ask you to do something and your mind will be the first to tell you that it is impossible. You might have never imagined that God can ever ask of you something like that. There will be sacrifices he will ask you to make. In all these things, you will have to ensure to the end. There will be seasons where all of a sudden it will look and feel as though God has abandoned you. You will pray and fast to see the move of God, but nothing will happen. In those moments, God will be checking at how strong your faith and trust in him are in the midst of daunting situations. There are times when he will take away every kind of crutch in your life to teach you to depend on him. These crutches are things and people you turn to first before him. And I tell you, the process will be painful and draining, but it will be worth it. At the end of the process, your greatness will never be hidden for whatsoever reason. You will speak like David as we read in Psalm 7121, where he says, thou shalt increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. In whatever season you are in right now, whether the training season or the testing season, you have to discern it with the help of the Spirit of God. All you are going through is not a punishment or a curse. Change your attitude towards it and know that you are going through more because you are called for more. The cost for greatness is not cheap. It is too expensive for a lot of people, but not for you. So hold on until you get to where God is taking you, to the mountaintop. If it was easy, everyone would get there. But the moment you commit yourself to the journey, no hardship will make you draw back. Because once you put your hand on the plow and look back, you are no longer fit for the kingdom and its assignments. There is more to your life than what you can see with your physical eyes. There is a seed of greatness in you that you must allow to grow and produce its fruit. 
No one can promise you a smooth ride, but God promises you that he will never leave you and you will not be defeated. Trust God. Don't let the devil steal your joy. Have you ever sat down and wondered how you ended up at the situation you were in? How you became an unhappy person, sad and lonely, staying in your room all day and listening to sad music? Or how you became the gloomy face at work and no joke seems funny to you anymore? Ever wondered where your joy, your happiness, your smiles went to? When that charming boy, that amazing father, that wonderful mom, that lovely daughter, the cheerful colleague, that ever smiling classmate, where all that went and got replaced with a sad and heavy heart. The answer could be simple as the devil stole your joy. John 10 and 10 says that the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy, to steal your happiness, to take away the things that make life worth living for, to replace your smiles with frowns, your laughter with an angry attitude. The devil came to kill your joy, to kill your motivation, to kill your drive in life. He came to kill your dreams, to kill the source of what gives you meaning in life. Yes, that's what the devil does. He came to destroy us, our families, our careers, our salvation, our relationships, and everything that makes this journey of life adventurous for us. He came to destroy all that. The devil prowls around like a hungry lion, looking for someone to devour. If you give him the chance, if you let yourself be his victim, he will definitely do his work. Don't let the devil steal your joy. He has many ways of doing that. He might use disease, poverty, loss of people we love, loss of a job, poor grades at school, family misunderstandings, and so much more to do that. If you give him the chance, he will do a great job at what he does best, which is to kill, steal, and destroy. Sometimes we find ourselves in very bad situations, and all you feel is the weight of these things crashing your heart, tearing your emotions into pieces. Anger, feelings of betrayal, loneliness, all these might be all you feel. That situation might have sucked all the will you had to fight out of you. It might have left you weak emotionally, your heart troubled and your mind stressed. Your body might be feeling fatigue. In the midst of such situations, it might be hard to see happiness in life. It might be hard to give even a fake smile. It might be hard to keep a happy moment alive before our thoughts trail off to what a bad situation we are in. That is the devil doing what he does best, robbing you of your happiness, telling you how much trouble you got so that you might live a depressed life. Don't let him have the chance. And the only way we can experience joy despite things being tough is if we rejoice in the Lord. Only God can give us true happiness, happiness that does not come from material things or properties we own, or beautiful families we have, or the high ranks at work, or the people around us. Joy that is not dependent on the happenings in our lives. Joy that does not know when we are lacking or when our pockets are heavy. Joy that lets us experience peace in the midst of storms. Such joy only comes from God. What is the source of your joy? Is it the best friend you have or the career you are making? Are you happy because you own the biggest mansion or the newest car in your neighborhood? Do you derive your joy in life from going places or wearing expensive clothes or being with great people? Now all these are things that the devil can steal. Remember Job? Now if his joy had been dependent on all that God has blessed him with, when the devil struck him, would he have survived the test? Definitely no. What will happen to you if you lose your job, can't pay your rent anymore, and you are kicked out of that mansion? What will happen to your happiness if you get fired from your dream job? Will you lose your hold onto life 
and say how it has no joy to make it worth living. The only way to keep the devil from stealing our joy is by making God the supreme source of it. If you must be happy, then let it not be just about how you went to that vacation and how amazing it was, but also how God blessed you with safe flights. If you must boast, then let it be about how you got an amazing father in heaven who loves you so much he let his son die for you. Be happy in Christ. Rejoice in him. When addressing the early church, Paul wrote in Philippians 3.1 and 4.4 respectively, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. If you choose to make the source of your happiness to be Jesus, you will never be unhappy. Bad things might happen to you, but they will not take away your joy. Paul wrote the book of Corinthians while in some prison at Ephesus. He said that he still rejoiced in God. His physical surroundings might have caused him worry. They might have caused him a lot of stress and anxiety about what would happen to him, but they did not. Why? Because his happiness did not depend on where he was or who he was with or what was happening in his life at the moment. His happiness was in God, and that is how he still rejoiced while in prison. And he even wrote a letter encouraging others who were going through hard times. He did not let the devil steal his joy from him. The joy that God gives is independent of circumstances. It is not dependent on what our current situations are. It is not about whether we got rent for the next month. It is not joy that only comes from our account balances reading something big. God does not give joy only when things are going all right for us. In the popular song by Reverend Shirley Caesar, a line goes like this, the joy that I have, the world did not give it to me and the world can't take it away. So whenever you feel like you are losing your life in life, so whenever you feel like you're losing your joy in life, remember this uplifting song, God restores, he restores health, finances, he restores friendships and heals broken families. God gives joy when circumstances speak sadness. He turns shame into respect and despise into glory. He can change your pain into joy if you let him. The joy God gives is what we all should crave. He gives us joy that the world cannot give. So instead of giving the devil a chance to steal your joy, you can turn to God and ask him to replenish it. Ask him to return to you your former happy self, the bubbly, cheerful person you were. You can ask him to make you joyful once again. Even David prayed to God, asking him to create the right spirit in him and to restore unto him the joy of salvation. Having the spirit of God within enables us to experience this joy that Satan can't steal. That is why David asked for the right spirit within him. Let your spirit be guarded by God. Let your treasure first be his kingdom. Make him your number one priority in life. The Bible says that where man's treasure is, there also is his heart. If you cherish something so much, then definitely it becomes your treasure. If you treasure God and make him the source of your happiness, the devil will not have access to it. He will not steal it from you. Paul is proof that we can resist from letting the devil steal our joy through situations of life. He is proof that you might be sick and in your deathbed, but still joyful in Christ. Paul demonstrated that you can be jailed over a false accusation and still find happiness in the Lord. He showed us that despite what life might throw our way, we can let God be the ultimate joy of our lives. Our spirits will always be happy. We will remain cheerful and full of life in Christ. Every new day when you wake up, tell the devil, Satan, you know what? I know your works. I know your evil schemes on this world. I know you came to steal, kill, and destroy. And today, I denounce your power over my life. You shall have no power over my joy, 
because it is not dependent on my circumstances. My joy is anchored in Christ Jesus, who by his death made a sacrifice so that I could live, and not just live, but live abundantly. You have no control over my happiness today. In this new day, I shall be glad and rejoice in my Lord Jesus. I shall be joyful because I serve a God who is the source of all the happiness. I shall rejoice in my salvation. I shall be happy wherever I go, whatever I do, whoever I talk to. My happiness shall touch them so that I might be a positive impact to souls today. I declare that I'm happy in the name of Jesus today and forever. There is so much power in our mouths. The Bible tells us that whatever we confess with our mouths, we shall possess. So speak joy, speak rejoicing, speak abundance, speak glory, speak grace abounding life, speak favor, speak all the positive things about your life. Denounce the devil and destroy his plans through prayer. When he comes to you, luring you to his traps, don't shy off as someone who has no weapon to face an enemy. Face him boldly. Tell him he has no power in your life. He has zero control over your happiness. Let it be known to him that you shall still be happy in Christ, despite the trials he has brought your way. The devil can only steal from you if you let him. Avoid him at all costs. Don't believe in the little lies he might be whispering to you. Don't let him access your treasure. And the only way you can do that is by keeping your treasure in heaven. If there is anything important in your life, then the best security you can give it is the blood of Jesus. You cannot leave your treasure in the open and expect to find it. Someone will steal it, of course. But when it is under heavenly security, no one including the devil, will steal it from you. Secure your joy in life through Jesus Christ today.